So this is a demonstration, a detailed demonstration of the structures which are located in the entire anterior abdominal wall. Let me show you the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is a canal which is the site which marks the location where the testis descended during embryonic life in males. Theoretically, it is present also in females because the round ligament of uterus passes through that, but it is of clinical significance only in males because by virtue of the descent of the testis, it takes a process of peritoneum with it called the process of vaginalis, which can be a site of inguinal hernia, which is much more common in males. So let's take a look at the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is a one and a half inch canal which is located just about one centimeter above the inguinal ligament and parallel to the medial two thirds of the inguinal ligament. So this is the proximate location of the inguinal canal. If we were to imagine a rectangular box, it has got four sides. The anterior wall is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis and laterally it is formed by the internal oblique. At this juncture I can mention that some of the fibers of the internal oblique, they take origin from the lateral part of the inguinal ligament and we can see those fibers here, these fibers. So these also forms part of the anterior wall. The roof is formed by the conjoint fibers of the internal oblique and the muscle deep to that, that is the transverse abdominis, which also takes partly origin from the inguinal ligament. And these two sets of fibers which take origin from the inguinal ligament, they curve over the inguinal canal and these curving fibers, the conjoint fibers of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis, they are referred to as the conjoint tendon. And they form the roof and we can see that also here. And this same conjoint tendon also forms part of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. But to continue with the roof, the roof is also formed by the inferior free margin of the fascia transversalis, which is known as the iliopubic tract. The posterior wall is formed by the conjoint muscle, which I already mentioned. It is formed by the fascia transversalis. And on the medial most side, medial one-fourth of the posterior wall is formed by a reflection of this inguinal ligament called the reflected inguinal ligament. So these three structures form the posterior wall. The floor is formed by the inferior upturned margin of the inguinal ligament called the pupar ligament and the lacunar ligament. Medially, just above the external iliac artery, this is the location of the a ring and we can see that ring here. That is known as the internal inguinal ring and it is through that ring that the ductus deferens passes and we can see the ductus deferens here. This is the ductus deferens which we have lifted up. And this is one of the most important contents of the inguinal canal. Internal ring is an opening in the fascia transversalis. And likewise, we have an opening in the aponeurosis of the external oblique. And that is this opening here. And this is known as the external ring. And the external ring has got two crura, a medial crust, and a lateral crust. And passing through the external ring, we have the spermatic cord which we have lifted up. And the most important content of the spermatic cord is this structure, which is the ductus deferens, which I mentioned here. And if you look closely here, when I exert traction here, it moves here. And when I pull here, it moves here. So this is the ductus deferens. So this is an important content. Another important content of the inguinal canal is this nerve here. This is the ilioinguinal nerve, which is piercing through the conjoint tendon and it is running and it will supply its structures in the thigh and in the scrotum. Another content is the gentrofemoral nerve we cannot see and the other muscles that we see here, these are derived from the conjoint tendon and muscle and that is referred to as the cremastric muscle, which plays a different role in the scrotum. So this is the inguinal canal. This is a site of inguinal hernia and in this particular cadaver, he had already undergone a surgery for inguinal hernia and we can see the remnants of the suture material. This blue color that we see here, this is non-absorbable suture that we use for inguinal hernia repair and that is proline. And I can show you some more remnants of the same structure here also. And we can clearly see this blue structure, this is non-absorbable 
proline which is used for inguinal hernia repair especially when we are strengthening the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So this is about the inguinal canal and its clinical relevance. The inguinal canal is present in the females as I said it gives passage to the round ligament of uterus but because there is no testis inguinal hernia as such is very rare in females. Now let me mention something about incisional and other hernia. The quickest is the midline incision through the linear one. It can be supraumbilical, infraumbilical. This gives very rapid approach. The thing about incision in the linear alba is that when we're closing it, because the linear alba is relatively avascular, we have to close it with non-absorbable material. I personally prefer nylon loop, and that gives a very strong repair. I have seen people repairing with absorbable material, and the patient comes back with an incisional hernia one year later. Incisional hernia can occur anywhere if it has not been repaired properly and there is a muscle weakness or the nerve has been cut. We can have hernia coming out through the umbilicus and that is not very uncommon in children. That is known as the umbilical hernia. In 93% of cases, the umbilical hernia in children closes by one year of age, so it does not require any surgery. Only 7% of them require surgery and that has to be repaired. In adults, the hernia does not come out through the umbilicus, it comes by the side of the umbilicus, usually above the umbilicus, just above. It is known as paraumbilical hernia. This difference is very important. And umbilical hernia is common in children. Paraumbilical hernia occurs in adults. In umbilical hernia, the her umbilicus is at the apex of the hernial sac. In paraumbilical hernia, the umbilicus is at the wall of the umbilical sac. So that occurs only in paraumbilical occurs only in adults. In many thin-walled individuals, we can see a gap between the superior rectus above the umbilicus. And especially when you ask them to lift up the head from the bed without using their hands, you will see a bulge. That is referred to as the divarication of recti, which is usually common, commonly seen in the upper part of the abdomen. So, so these are some of the incisional and other ventral hernias that we can get in the abdominal wall, depending on what situation it is. So that is all for now. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Dr. Sanjay Sanya is signing out. Have a nice day.